Charlie, welcome to the Health Path podcast. It's a real honour to be able to, uh, to pick your brain today. Hello, mate. It's great to be here. Thanks for having me. Yeah, so I think it was, um, it was the beginning of the first lockdown that I read your first book. Um, mm-hmm. And ever since then, I've been really interested in the role of dream work, dreaming, lucid dreaming, and how we can utilise it in different ways. Um, and I read two of your books probably over a, a two, three week period. And I went from never really remembering my dreams to having my first full lucid dream. Um, right. And it was just one of the most like profound experiences, like understanding that we have access to this sort of thing um, with a few techniques and practices and becoming more mindful is just, it kind of blows your mind, I think, when you start to experience these things. So firstly, thank you. Uh, for all well, the work thank you. you. Well do. done for, for doing the practices and making it happen. <laughs> yeah, it was, a, it was a good time, definitely. But obviously there, there might be some people tuning in today, Charlie, that aren't yet familiar with you or your work. So are you happy just to do a little bit of a, an introduction? Yeah, so let's look at lucid dreaming first. So this experience that you had, a lucid dream is any dream where you're actively aware of the fact you're dreaming as the dream is happening. So anytime someone's had a dream, where they're sound asleep, but in the dream, they go, oh, wow, this is all a dream right now. That was a lucid dream. doesn't matter whether it was a happy dream or a sad dream or a nightmare or whatever. The moment you went, ah, this is a dream, you were lucid. And the moment that happened, an interesting thing, thing happens to the brain. Your prefrontal cortex lights up, which usually isn't activated during sleep. In fact, one of the kind of dominant characteristics of REM dreaming sleep is lack of prefrontal cortex activation, which the scientists believe is the part of the brain associated with the sense of self and sense of agency, which would explain pretty tightly why you can have dreams you're other people and why you can have dream dreams such bizarre things and not kind of cotton on, like, you know, that you're talking to the queen of Egypt or that you're dreaming you're a child when you're an adult or something like that. And it also makes perfect sense that when you get lucid and you go, oh, wow, I'm having a dream. This is Alex having a dream or Charlie having a dream. The prefrontal cortex would light up. Oh, sorry. I have a little puppy who got spayed yesterday. You know, she oh. had a lot of <laughs> and um, I think the tube they put down her throat is making her cough. Um, anyway, you're all right, Waffles. Um, so if you hear sat, those sounds, anyone who's listening on audio, it's, it's, uh, it's a puppy. <laughs> so that part of the brain lights up. And the cool thing about that part of the brain is it's the same part of the brain that activates um, neuroplasticity. So the phenomena of neuroplasticity is fundamentally based upon activation of the prefrontal cortex because it's kind of consciously doing something. There's this conscious aspect to it that that, um, really kind of drives neuroplasticity. So if you're having loads of normal non-lucid dreams about playing football, you're probably not gonna get any better at football. But what they've discovered, and actually football, we can use that exact example, is that if you become lucid in your dreams and then you practice football in your lucid dreams, so out of all the things you could do, whatever you choose to practice football, um, you actually get better at football the next day. Um, So they've shown you can actually increase waking state performance by training in the lucid dream. And not only that, once you become lucid, the brain doesn't think you're asleep. The brain thinks you're awake. So... In the work I've been doing with veterans and trauma, if you can have a lucid dream where in that lucid dream, you realize uh, I'm not really back in Iraq, I'm dreaming I'm back in Iraq and can then either, you know, confront the fear or allow the fearful thing to happen, feel asleep because, you know, it's just a dream. As far as the brain's concerned, you actually did that, you know, and the brain will actually start to rewire itself in favor of either the newly learned skill if you're playing football or the newly integrated trauma if you're working with that. Um, so it's a really powerful way of engaging something as everyday as skills rehearsal to as profound as trauma integration. Amazing. And I love the fact that we can start to understand that um, neurobiology of it ultimately as well. Mm. Um, so obviously your, your previous books, one of them is very much around supporting people lucid dream and sort of teaching mm-hmm. them the techniques. And there's one around shadow work as well and how we can use dream work there. But you've got a book, is it out on the 26th, I think? Yes, and I've got a copy here called Wake Up to Sleep. Are we doing video or just audio? Video. Okay, cool. So people can see this, yeah. (laughs) Uh, Wake Up to Sleep. Uh, Five powerful practices to transform stress and trauma for peaceful sleep and mindful dreams. Um, So yeah, this is basically, this is the book that's based on the six-week course that I've been doing with veterans and serving military. Um, So it's really kind of military-grade sleep techniques here. Let me just get the puppy. Sorry, ma'am. But no, don't worry. Come 
Oh. Right, you can either edit that or keep it in. Maybe it's nice <laughs> okay, to keep it in. It's kind of real life. Um, I would have given us some painkillers in an hour, so maybe they're starting to wear off right now. No. Okay, where was I? About the book. Um, yeah, the book is based on the six-week course that I've been doing with um, veterans and serving military personnel. It's been developing over the past kind of five or six years, uh, and the book is kind of an adapted version of that to make it available to, to, uh, for all people. So it's, you know, someone recently called it, you know, military grade sleep tips. <laughs> and I was like, well, I guess it is. I mean, it's a bit of a, you know, a bit of an Americanization there, but it really is because the groups I was working with historically have some of the highest levels of post-traumatic stress disorder. So the techniques in the book, if they work for them, they're probably going to work for other people too. And I used to say for more everyday traumas, I now realize the very naive statement because trauma is trauma, whether it's from a literal war zone or from a familial war zone, trauma is trauma. And in many cases, the complex CPTSD that um, everyday you know, civilian people have who've been working with childhood sexual abuse uh, or um, actually any, any trauma from childhood and in adulthood is um, just as traumatizing as a combat zone trauma. So yeah, trauma is trauma. And the book seems to really help stress and trauma affected sleep. And it has got lucid dreaming in it, but only a couple of chapters. So this is my first kind of non, fully non lucid dreaming book. Mm. It's based on sleep awareness, which is kind of like becoming your own sleep tracker. So keeping a nocturnal journal, being aware of your sleep, being aware of your dreams, uh, how much sleep you're getting, how you feel upon awakening, really kind of empowering yourself with the knowledge of how you sleep. The second foundation is deep relaxation. So it's working with yoga nidra practices. So lying down forms of meditation and also a term that actually isn't in the book because I only just heard him use it, but it's the perfect term that Professor uh, Andrew Huberman from Stanford uses, non-sleep deep rest, NSDR, non-sleep uh. deep rest, which is basically the scientific term he's given to yoga nidra. Forms uh -huh. of, of deeply relaxing, usually lying down mindfulness practice where you're not quite asleep, but you're kind of getting there in these deep hypnagogic relaxation states uh, and all the benefits of that. The third foundation is breath work, um, but not kind of Wim Hof stuff. In fact, pretty much the direct opposite of that. Very slow, deep breathing. So breathing at five breaths a minute, which is about 70% reduction. Uh, most people are breathing at about 15 to 20 breaths a minute. Then the fourth foundation is nightmares, transforming nightmares, not only the nightmares themselves, but actually our perception of nightmares, what they're doing from a neurobiological point of view and how to work with them. And then the final foundation is lucid dreaming. Brilliant. And I think we said off air how, how relevant this is for our conversation today. So a lot of our community, although are coming to us with sort of physical health conditions, whether it's a diagnosis of an autoimmune disease or mm -hmm. some of these kind of syndromes like chronic fatigue syndrome and irritable bowel syndrome. Um, I'm particularly interested in sort of the research around adverse childhood events and how mm -hmm. trauma in our childhood significantly increases our risk of disease in adulthood. Yeah. Um, so a lot of our listeners, uh, I think it's safe to say, will have some degree of trauma and if we don't define it as trauma then the rest are going to have obviously just chronic stress of different types mm. that are driving mm. some of this or their health issues mm. so are we able to maybe just touch on some of these um these sort of elements of the new book and and yeah. how we can utilize them to support our own healing yeah so let's look at inflammation because in the book the three um kind of major obstacles that i look at i break it down into uh, the way I'm kind of moving it aside from sleep hygiene is that sleep hygiene tips are based on changing the external environment of your bedroom in order to create the causes and conditions to make sleep easier to occur, right? So don't look at your phone for an hour before bed, have a hot bath, don't have coffee after lunchtime, this kind of stuff. Uh, those are great. They, you know, people with moderate to low levels of stress, they can work quite well. But people with high levels of stress, and to be honest, the last 18 months, who hasn't got high levels of stress? and absolutely people working with trauma, sleep hygiene tips won't even touch the sides. It's like offering someone a plaster when they've been in a car crash. Mm. It's well-meaning, but it will do nothing long-term. Might have some short-term effects, but very little um, long-term effects. This book is based on working with the primary obstacle to sleep, which is a dysregulated nervous system. And the three major things that dysregulate the nervous system are stress, trauma, and inflammation. 
Uh, and in fact, they kind of work within each other. They're, mm. they're kind of indicative and causal from each other. And um, inflammation, I think, is probably the, the, an interesting one to look at because of your work with gut health. Direct link between gut microbiome and sleep. Um, you know, if, if we're eating foods before bed or just during the day that put the body into a state of inflammation, inflammation, oh, sorry, the direct link between inflammation and sleep seems to be a raise in body temperature. Sleep is fundamentally about a uh, regulation of the homeostasis system in the body. So it's about temperature regulation. And even low levels of inflammation caused by uh, simple sugars and the inflammation that comes from eating simple sugars and certain simple carbs um, that might make those sugars slightly elevates the um, uh, temperature. And even a minor elevation of temperature can affect sleep. Um, so you might've heard the sleep hygiene tip about having your bedroom cooler mm. than usual bedroom should be kind of so cold that if you put your foot outside the duvet you should want to put it back in you know it should be really really quite cool the bedroom but actually we haven't looked at the body if the body is too warm because of the internal inflammation caused by our diet then actually you can have the coolest bedroom in the world you're still going to be too hot to sleep um, and also because of the way inflammation uh, activates the fight or flight system in the autonomic nervous system. And of course, for sleep to occur, we need to switch off the fight or flight system and switch on the parasympathetic system. You can be doing all the kind of sleep hygiene tips you like, but unless you have learned how to switch off the fight or flight system, you're gonna be staring at the ceiling till dawn. So none of the sleep hygiene things look at that fundamental obstacle, which is an overactive or, or a, a dysregulated nervous system. So everything in the book looks at how can we regulate the nervous system through breath, through deep relaxation. There's only a, a small, section on diet i wish there could have been more but the word count didn't allow uh, but i do talk about anti-inflammatory uh, diet diets uh, and a few herbal things there which have uh, been really helpful for sleep and the reason they're helpful for sleep is actually because they're anti-inflammatories things like um oh i was get this wrong rodeo rosea or rosea ro rodea I yeah which one it is uh, that's a that's brilliant for sleep but it's fundamentally an anti-inflammatory uh things like shilajit brilliant for sleep Fundamentally, it's an anti-inflammatory. Ashwagandha, brilliant sleep. What's it doing? It's working as an anti-inflammatory. It's not actually these things, they're not sedatives. You know, they're, they're things that lower inflammation and also really good for your gut. Shilajit's very good for your gut. It's got lots of kind of micronutrients and stuff. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, all your work around gut microbiome and stuff will be so helpful to sleep. Fascinating. Did you find in your research whether people who are kind of chronically cold have an impact. So obviously you talk about inflammation, sort of increasing internal body temperature and having an impact. Do you know if it's the same, if it's the opposite end of the spectrum? I haven't seen any science on that, but I mean, any extremes of temperature will affect your ability to fall asleep. Okay. Because again, it's like this homeostasis. It's about the body needs to kind of lower in temperature, then it kind of rises a little bit. And the temperature uh, works with the sleep site, sleep stages. So each stage of sleep actually has a slightly different movement in body temperature. So I'm assuming that if you were super cold, then yeah, that would be, that would negatively impact sleep as well. Um, but I know it's much easier to fall asleep when you're too cold than when you're too hot. Mm. Kind of in the, in the subjective feeling. I know in Chinese medicine, there's a lot about hot and cold there, but that's not literal hot and cold. Right. Um, that's kind of slightly different, but in that case, yes, absolutely. Too much heat or too much cool in the kind of um, internal chi system will definitely have an effect on sleep. Amazing. And um, I guess I'm quite interested also in sort of, you talked about, um, I think you mentioned nightmares earlier mm -hmm. as well and how some of this work can be incorporated into that. And I've, I've seen some studies talking about how certainly lucid dreaming can be helpful in sort of resolving the trauma that's yeah. leading to those nightmares. Is that right? Yes. In fact, Alex, I'll give you the scoop on this because this is the first podcast I've done since I got the uh, results through yesterday. Um, in July, I was lead facilitator on a study with IONS, Institute of Noetic Sciences in the Bay Area in America. They do a lot of really rigorous science, but around reasonably woo-woo subjects. So it's a really great place if you've got funding to go and they'll, they'll explore stuff that a lot of other people don't want to explore, but they're actually very well known for their rigorous science. So we did a study on lucid dreaming for treatment of PTSD nightmares. Now there have actually been, I can think of at least half a dozen, maybe seven or eight different peer reviewed scientific studies that have already proven lucid dreaming to be one of the most powerful interventions for post-traumatic stress disorder nightmares. Because 
once you become loose, actually through the brain, that thing we mentioned before, um, if you look at the work of Bessel van der Kolk and others, he directly says that for trauma to be integrated, the parts of the brain that were knocked out during the traumatic experience, precisely the prefrontal cortex, need to be reactivated for trauma to be fully integrated. What's the part of the brain that's activated when you get lucid? The prefrontal cortex. I mean, it's right there. But at a psychological level, oh, sorry, another biological level seems to be that um, when you become lucid, there's a massive drop in stress hormones because you, you know, I'm back in Iraq, I'm back in Iraq. Oh, I'm dreaming I'm back in Iraq. Okay, it's still a freaking scary nightmare. At least I know it's just a nightmare. I'm not actually in, in, um, in danger here. And it's believed that elevated levels of stress hormones during REM sleep is what uh, negates the healing property of nightmares in people with PTSD. Because huh. for like most people, nightmares have a healing property to them. They're actually very good. Uh, but with people with high levels of PTSD, because with that PTSD comes high levels of noradrenaline, the brain isn't made safe during REM sleep by these high levels of neuroadrenaline, but lucid dreaming seems to drop those. And at a psychological level, if you can train the mind to know, oh, I'm not really back in Iraq, I'm simply dreaming I'm back in Iraq, it has a powerful deconditioning effect on the way uh, that trauma is being um, integrated by the brain, because in many ways, a nightmare is a dream that's shouting. It's shouting for our attention. It's saying, you know, here lies unintegrated um, psychological trauma or energy in fact it's a bit like here lies the treasure right it's, it's more like that but it's 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 drawing our attention to something so if you can become lucid in a nightmare you've told the nightmare you know no need to shout so you see a big decrease in nightmares if people start to get lucid anyway so we did this study but the cool thing about our study was we were using uh, saliva biomarkers so we were getting people to take spit tests before and after the lucid dream the working hypothesis was integrating a trauma in a lucid dream will have such a profound effect on the subject that you will see a drop in inflammation in the bloodstream through the saliva biomarkers. Um, so we're trying to prove basically the physical healing properties of lucid dreaming. The results haven't been published yet. So there's, I'm only allowed to mention certain things, but what I can mention is we had 55 people in the study, all of whom had high levels of PTSD. So for one, I was like, what, 55 people on a Zoom stream, all of whom have high levels of PTSD. Are we even going to get any lucid dreams? You know, I thought maybe I spoke to the funder. I was like, I don't know if we're going to get any lucid dreams, man. You know, this is a this will be a group that's really going through it. We had 73 percent of the group managed to have a lucid dream or multiple lucid dreams within one week. It was a one week. Wow. Um, their PTSD scores were measured before, directly after the study and three weeks after. After the study, all of them, all of them had lowered PTSD scores. And three weeks later, the vast majority of them still had lower PTSD <laughs> scores. Um, it said it was to be a highly, uh, highly uh, statistically significant was the kind of scientific thing. Basically, the scientists sent me all the stuff. Then he sent me a voice and I went, dude, this is freaking huge. Like, <laughs> you know, we did it. Um, so we got really good results. But the really interesting result we got was that even that 20% or whatever it is, percentage who didn't have a lucid dream, they still had a drop in their PTSD score, which leads us to believe that just learning about lucid dreaming, just knowing it's a possibility, just going through the process of trying to integrate your nightmares has a really powerful uh, lowering of post-traumatic stress disorder symptoms, wow. which is really cool because you think, why isn't this stuff being taught in the NHS? Well, because maybe not everyone can learn to lucid dream. It takes quite a lot of effort. I mean, everyone can, but has everyone got the time and effort to put in to do it? I mean, you nailed it. You, you got lucid within a couple of nights, right? But most people, it takes a few weeks, maybe even a few months. But if we can prove that actually just the process of learning lucid dreaming, just going on a course can help lower PTSD, that will really help it get into, into the mainstream. Uh, and as far as the saliva marker goes, very promising results. That's what I'm allowed to say. <laughs> very promising results, which Amazing. is just so fucking cool, man. I'm like so excited by that. Yeah, that is incredible. And I think, um, you know, one of the things you talk about in, in what your, uh, I'm not sure if it's your first or your second, but sort of the pure lucid dreaming book is obviously sort of being lucid in, in day life, you know, the, yeah. the concept of mindfulness and being present as a way to facilitate that when we are dreaming. Um, yeah. So some of what you can learn through the likes of your work and practices is, going to be beneficial for PTSD, trauma, stress, IBS, et cetera, as well. Good point. Yeah, good point. Actually, just learning to be more lucid in the waking state will have 
positive effects on all those things. Yeah. And they found that things like, um, well, it's well known that things like, you know, mindfulness practice in the day makes lucid dreaming easier, right? Because you're kind of training your mind right. in that same thing. They found some other interesting results, which was that um, having lots of lucid dreams makes you more present in the waking state. So much so that people who have regular lucid dreams actually have a, a part of the brain that's bigger than other people. Uh, of course, when that came out, I was like, oh, lucid dreaming gives you a bigger brain with the scientific <laughs> evidence. And it's, it's a ridiculous thing to say, but it's actually true. There is a part of the brain in people who have regular lucid dreams. So you'll be hitting like two lucid dreams a week, which that's quite rare to find somebody who's having like, you know, consistently a couple of lucid dreams a week. Um, but yeah, they have a bigger part of the brain. It's the part of the brain to do with um, non-linear non -linear thinking. So like basically to be able to think outside the box and uh, levels of creativity and insight, which makes sense. Because if you're constantly going, hang on a minute, this isn't real. This is all internally generated hallucination. I'm actually asleep in bed. Fuck, I'm dreaming. You know, that's really non-linear non thought. You know, you're really kind of thinking outside the box there. So I guess it makes sense that it's stimulating that part of the brain and somehow makes it larger. Yeah. Um, so yeah, levels of insight and kind of lucidity in the waking state seem to go up as well. I mean, I'm still waiting on that one, but yeah, apparently that's <laughs> what <the science> says. <laughs> Excellent. Uh, I, have a, I have a couple of um, personal questions, if that's OK. Well, I've got you. I want to maximise this time, um, but hopefully they will help others as well. Um, the first one is I have, I wouldn't say a, a regular, it's probably happens once or twice a year, but it's happened probably for the last three or four years. So I have what I would define as a, a nightmare, mm. but I, I shout myself awake. Mm. So I use my voice to basically wake me up out of it. And obviously one of the principles I think I'm right in saying is obviously we need to stay present in that nightmare and we need to essentially to, uh, gain lucidity as a way to process and integrate it. And I'm sure there are listeners who might have a similar experience. So are there any just little tips that you're able to give us in regards to in that sort of situation is there anything we can do to try and I guess calm ourselves down almost mm. I mean I think the first thing is to know that uh, if you are ever lucid in a nightmare again try not to wake up and then to know why it's good not to wake up every time you wake from a nightmare the unintegrated psychological energy or perhaps even trauma that led to the creation of the nightmare remains unintegrated so it has to come back this is why our nightmares recur but our kind of seemingly happy dreams don't, right? The reason the dream where you had a dinner date with your favorite celebrity or something, you only had that once was because it was a happy dream. It was integrated on the spot. You didn't reject it. You didn't wake up from it. In fact, you wanted to stay in it. So it didn't need to come back a second time. But every time you wake from a nightmare, whether it's intentionally in that case, you know, shouting yourself awake or just the shock of the nightmare, it's so scary it wakes us up. It's like a therapy session that we've left halfway through. So let's say this was a one-on-one -on -one Zoom lucid dream therapy session or something and then you know waffles started barking and I had to end the session I'd be emailing you back straight away oh, Alex you know we need to finish the session no no I can't let you go we need to we need to close the session or at least finish what we we're talking about right because I don't want you to leave kind of halfway through a therapy session the brain is doing exactly the same thing so recurring nightmares aren't a sign of the brain trying to punish us or as a lot of veterans think it's because of what I did or what I didn't do, or what I allowed to happen, and that my mind's like punishing me for this. It's, I'm, it's, this is my penance. No, it's actually the mind being a, being a really thoughtful therapist. I go, mate, I just don't want you to, to be halfway through a therapy session. We need to finish this one, so I'm going to give you that nightmare again. It's a bit of medicine, um, but it is a medicine. So that's the first thing, to reframe it, to know that to stay in the nightmare is a good idea. As Krishnamurthy said, the seeing is the doing. And because a nightmare is a dream that's shouting, if you can be lucid in a nightmare, you don't need to do anything. It doesn't need to be, you know, my TED talk, I talk about hugging your demons and all this kind of stuff. Just being in the night, being like, okay, I'm dreaming, I'm dreaming. Okay, oh my God, that's really scary, but I know it's just a dream. Even that is really powerful. And that can actually end nightmares. Many people just won't have a night, won't have the recurring nightmare again if they can manage to do that. Let alone if you, oh, I'm lucid. So because I'm lucid, I'm totally safe. And because I'm lucid, everything's part of my mind. So that monster is not actually a monster. It's a symbolic representation of that thing that happened to me. Well, I should probably go and like talk to it or hug it or, or dissolve it into light or, you know, something to symbolically show integration. And if you do that, you're really cooking. And if you can have that level, you, you see, like we saw in the study, big drops in PTSD and nightmares just not coming back again. Mm. Um, 
So how to do that? One is to learn lucid dreaming. <clears throat> the other is to do something before sleep that will help regulate the nervous system that might not stop nightmares happening, but it might reduce the kind of severity of the nightmares, meaning you don't wake from them. Okay. So that would be something like slow, deep breathing, like coherent breathing, breathing at five breaths a minute, or maybe a yogic breathing technique, like four, seven, eight breath, um, or some non-sleep deep rest, like yoga nidra or deep relaxation before bed, so that those adrenaline levels are already dropped, so they don't kind of max out in the nightmare. Mm. Um, but really interesting what you said about, you know, shouting yourself awake. That's called motor breakthrough. So in the dream state, you're paralyzed for the most part. Make small twitches and movements, but basically major muscle groups are paralyzed. But if the emotional uh, energy of the nightmare becomes so much, you can have this thing called motor breakthrough, which is where like you scream awake or you kind of thrash and wake yourself up. Um, it seems to be a kind of a, you know, ejector switch. If the nightmare is just ramping up too much and there's a kind of eject the switch to get you out of it. Um, but if you can, yeah, if you could stay in there even better, because then you can really mm. integrate the trauma on its own term. Okay, excellent. On its own excellent. turf, I mean. Um, and the second one is more of just, I guess, I'm curious if you've heard this from other people um, going through, you know, learning lucid dreaming, which is, I feel it completely changed my relationship with sleep. And what mm. I mean by that is, I think previously I'd had some quite like rigid rules, not necessarily mm. that I was fully aware of around, this is when I've got to get to sleep. Uh, mm. I've got to be in bed by this time. Mm -hmm. If I don't get enough sleep, I'm going to be tired the next day. Mm. And some of the techniques that you teach around, you know, journaling in the night so you don't forget the dream and maybe having a mantra going to sleep about how I got excellent dream recall um, they really started to break down, I feel, kind of limiting beliefs or the narrative I had around sleep. I don't know if that's kind of something that you've experienced or heard about before. Yeah, so there's, it's kind of, it's horses for courses. Um, you need to be getting enough sleep. Your sleep needs to be stabilized enough for you to be able to make the slight changes that lucid dreaming asks of you and still be able to get to sleep. So like in the new book, Lucid Dreaming is the last two chapters, it comes after all that other stuff because it's a lot of people reading the book are working with trauma and high levels of stress. So the first thing is like regulate their sleep. Then once they're on a solid, doesn't matter how many hours, but a solid, however many hours they're getting, and it's kind of consistent, then you can start making those um, slight kind of deviations to sleep routine. Because yeah, lucid dreaming does ask in some of them that you wake up at certain times just for like five minutes, but wake mm -hmm. up then fall asleep doing a certain mantra. Um, if you remember a dream in the middle of the night, taking a couple of minutes to write it down. So we're not talking about like big changes to sleep, but it is making you okay with being awake in the middle of the night. Now, weirdly, because lucid dreaming teaches you to be okay with being awake in the middle of the night, that's actually really good for insomniacs because a lot of insomnia is based on fighting the natural cycles of the night. In fact, my meditation teacher, Rob Nen, defined insomnia as the process of trying to fall asleep. It's like, that's what insomnia is. It's trying to fall asleep. You can't try to fall asleep. Sleep is the culmination of lack of trying. It's where you stop trying so much, you stop even trying to be conscious and then you black out and you fall asleep, right? Or lucid dream is slightly different. But um, so I think, yeah, what you said there about it kind of breaking down the rigidness around sleep and giving us some flexibility means a lot of people are now more okay with how they sleep. And it also encourages things like naps because napping is really good for lucid dreaming. So now it's like, there's another reason to have a nap as well as all the science showing how brilliant napping is. Um, for anyone listening, I know that, you know, 10 years ago, the kind of jury was out on naps, where they were good, where they're bad. There just wasn't enough research into it. Now, like almost everybody could do with a nap. Um, you're better at everything after a nap that we can measure, 30% better at learning any new skill, as long as your nap isn't more than 90 minutes. And as long as it is within six hours of your intended bedtime, They'll have no negative effect on your sleep. So it's about timing your nap. Um, but napping is really good for you. So yeah, encourage things like napping and encourage the flexibility around sleep. Um, it encourages you to be creative, that sleep suddenly becomes this empowered place. It isn't somewhere you just surrender to, it's somewhere you befriend and then learn how to kind of change your dreams and see the dreams changing and you know, learn to really, yeah, kind of do a handshake practice with the night, which I think is really good. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it yeah. completely revolutionized my whole thought process because, you know, I think many of us think about sleep as just this sometimes, you know, annoying thing that we've got to do. Yeah. <laughs> like people often want people to stay busy. 
Uh, whereas, you know, especially when I was at the beginning of that lucid dreaming and just starting to remember dreams again, that alone is quite a, a fun process. But mm. it got me excited, like going to bed. It sounds a bit silly, yes. but it completely changed everything. That's um, so good. Yeah. Just something you said there about the, you know, people wanting to just kind of sleep as quickly as they can. You know, this idea about sleep when I'll die, stuff like that. Yeah. One of the scariest studies I cover in the book, I cover this in the first chapter, or maybe even the first couple of pages. Um, they did a study on people who were only getting five or six hours sleep, um, but were saying they feel totally fine. So National Sleep Association and American Sleep Association, they're all saying seven to nine hours uh, for most people is, is what to aim for, right? Because seven to nine hours, you're probably not going to be asleep for all that time. You could aim at kind of seven to nine hours in bed, then that might average out into a nice solid eight hours, whatever it might be. Um, but they work with a group who only get five or six hours, but claim, I feel totally fine. They have great social lives. They're great at work. They're professionals. They're like, I am the outlier here because I'm fine. They give them certain mental acuity tests to do after five or six hours sleep. And although they claim they feel totally fine, their brain sends a completely different message. Like they're sick. They're like, dude, your like level of mental acuity is really low. You're not getting enough sleep. And that was the most tragic one I found because it means essentially these we have become so habituated to being sleep deprived we think it's our normal mm. it has been so long since we had sufficient sleep that we have grown to normalize the state of low functioning sleep deprivation it's called um, uh, suboptimal neurological functioning has become the normal for so many people <laughs> then when you force these people to sleep more so you basically pay them to stay in bed for like 14 hours uh, for like uh, three days straight they were like got to stay in bed right most people max out at about 11 to 12 hours the first couple of nights and then settle into an eight to nine hour rhythm. Mm -hmm. um, so there's a lot of us who believe we're getting enough sleep and we kind of feel like we are, we're fine. But actually it's just, we haven't given ourselves um, space to have the sleep that awaits us. And when you do give people that extra hour or two hours sleep, you know, they claim that they've kind of, you know, tapped into some universal source of energy. It's like, no, dude, that's your normal. You know, that's, that was always there for you. Um, and it doesn't have to be loads more, just one hour sleep. That's another interesting study. Um, just one extra hour of sleep has profound uh, benefits. That was a study from, uh, on, based on daylight saving, actually. So, you know, when everyone kind of loses or gains a night's mm -hmm. sleep. Um, I was under the strange illusion that it might just be England who does that. It might just be Britain that does that. In fact, it's like 1.6 billion people around the world from like 12 different countries or more follow these daylight saving rules on based on different time zones. So there is a time where a large amount of people, like 1.6 billion people are all losing an hour of sleep. And they find that the day after that, when everyone's losing an hour of sleep, um, there's a 20% rise in heart attacks and cardiac arrest and a 15% rise in traffic deaths. Wow. Now, those are not small numbers when you're dealing with such a large percentage population. That is tens of thousands more people die after losing one night's uh, one hour of sleep. Huh. However, conversely, that night where we all get an extra hour in bed, the next day there's a 23% drop in heart attacks worldwide. And again, a similar thing, I think it's 10 to 15% drop in uh, traffic deaths. Um, again, that's, that's tens of thousands of lives, say tens of thousands of people do not die by getting one extra hour of sleep. And that really stuck with me because are we all going to be able to get seven to nine hours sleep? Like the doctors, like the sleep foundation tell us probably not, but if we're only getting five and you can move it up to six, that'll profoundly change your life. If you're only getting six hours sleep and you can move it to seven, that'll profoundly change your life. And it doesn't have to be at night. We need to look at sleep in 24 hour periods. So when it says seven to nine hours per night, it should really say, and they should change it, it should say seven to nine hours per 24 hour period. So if you're only getting you know, six hours sleep at night and if you can get a cheeky one hour nap the next day and that stacks up to a seven hours, then you're well within that range and really yeah. approaching neurological optimization, they say. Brilliant. And I think I'm right in saying, you know, that some people seem, I've read from an indigenous perspective, that's the natural sort of sleep cycle. They're kind of up oh, at, yeah before the sun and they'll have a nap later on. Yeah, that's really cool. The kind of two sleep things. Uh, BBC did a, did a good article on this. And I think in um, um, Why We Sleep, Matthew Walker mentions this. I dug a bit kind of deeper into that in this book and found 
Um, you've got over 500 references cross-culturally, multiple different uh, uh, countries referencing this to sleep um, way of sleeping, which is basically going to sleep when the sun went down. So obviously courses would change based on seasonal fluctuation. But let's say you're going to bed within a couple of hours of sun going down. So you're going to bed about 8 p.m. or something. You'd sleep for three or four hours. Then you'd wake up around midnight and you would stay awake for two hours, wide awake, doing stuff like pubs would reopen. People would have sex. People would milk their cows because they thought the milk had a better um, uh, consistency or something. You milk them in the middle of the night. Like people were awake doing stuff for a couple of hours. And two hours later, they would go back to sleep until the sun came up. And people have been sleeping that, uh, sleeping that way in Britain. And then Britain as the center of the empire in the 1800s, that affected the sleeping patterns of a lot of the world. And if you look at indigenous countries who weren't affected by empire or industrialization, they also reflect that similar sleeping pattern. Now, if we look at the most common form of insomnia reported around the world, it's called sleep maintenance insomnia. This is it. I can fall asleep okay at night. About three to four hours later, I wake up and feel completely alert for two hours. A couple of hours later, there is the ability to fall back asleep until they wake up in the morning. Wait, hang on. How has no one made this connection here? <laughs> Could it be that there are millions of people who are not insomniacs? But the doctors don't know this. GPs don't know this. I have great respect for, for GPs and doctors. My sister has just become a doctor and she confirmed in her six year training, she had two hours on sleep and our whole six year training. She sent me the PowerPoint. Actually, it was very good two hours, but, you know, two hours and a six year training. So we go to our doctors. We explain this, how we're sleeping. They don't know any better. So they're telling us, oh, we're insomniacs. They want to medicalize it. They want to you know, give us meds, uh, pathologize the sleep pattern. It could be completely normal. You know, in 1900, in the New York Times, they talk about the newfangled malaise of insomnia. Like insomnia as a social concept, construct was not around until the 1900s. Like New, New York Times are talking about that, this new thing called insomnia. And that's about 20 or 30 years after the last reports of the two sleep cycle, because the Industrial Revolution changed. We needed people to wake up, be in the factories, work till past sundown with electrical lighting mm. uh, and then wake up early to come and work in the factories again. I mean, it sounds conspiratorial, but it's actually, it's all there. And also the education system was built around that as well. Yeah. Anyway, I don't want to get into that, but very, very interesting. Yeah. Really fascinating. All right, I put us under a little bit of pressure, um, Charlie. We've got nine minutes and okay. I, I want us to go back to, if you're happy to, um, obviously the new book. So you've mentioned, yeah. You mentioned anti-inflammatory diets. You mentioned certain nutraceuticals like rhodiola, ashwagandha. Um, you mentioned breathing exercises. So mm -hmm. things like five breaths a minute. So really mm -hmm. slowing down the breath yeah. compared to what's probably the most popular um, breathing practice, shall we say at the moment, which is obviously the Wim Hof, as you mentioned mm -hmm. earlier, which is the other end of the spectrum. Strangely enough though, the Wim Hof method leads to exactly the same place as coherent breathing because they both actually lead to a regulation of the nervous system. But one kind of maxes out the fight or flight to such a point that it, it almost kind of blows the fuse and then boom, big parasympathetic response. And the other is to very gradually just move into parasympathetic response without blowing the fuse. So for trauma sensitive people, like I would never teach, I, I'm quite into Wim Hof stuff actually, but I would never teach that to a group of veterans. Right. Like, it's just way too possibly triggering for some. Um, whereas coherent breathing has no contraindications. It's like medically based, really good. For, sorry, carry on. No, no, it's really good to know. So with, with that, um, is it just doing it for a certain time period, for example? Yeah, so the people who did a lot of the research on the coherent breathing stuff are these, um, there are a couple actually, Pat Gerbarg and Richard Brown, and these guys are mainstream New York psychiatrists. She's Harvard Medical School. He's Columbia assistant professor. These are not hippy dippy people. These are mainstream psychiatrists. So when they say that breathing at the nominal rate of five breaths a minute, 20 to 40 minutes a day is one of the most effective treatments for PTSD and has none of the side effects of the medication that we used to prescribe you, people start to take note. And they're very big in America. It's like offered in the veterans associations. They work with the 9-11 commission. But in, in the UK, it just doesn't seem to have arrived yet. But I've done their teacher training now, the level, level two teacher training now, um, along with some a few other people in the UK. So we're really trying to bring this, this in. And their organization called Breath, Body, Mind, which is the use of coherent breathing along with um, movement. So uh, mindful movement, which is really good for other symptoms of PTSD, such as... Um, dissociation and, and disembodiment. Um, 
And yeah, they found that five breaths a minute is, this sounds crazy. When I first read it, I was like, this can't be true, is the optimal human breath rate. So for 90% of human beings alive today, breathing, it's actually 5.1 breaths a minute, whatever, let's call it five breaths a minute, synchronizes the electrical rhythms of the heart, the brain, and the lungs. You can see this on a graph. They're like all over the place. You start breathing at five breaths a minute. Within seven minutes, they go. Wow. And they start making this perfect wave. It's like, it's, it's nuts. And you're like, but we're all so different. How can there be an optimal <laughs> breath rate? But it turns out there is. Um, like heart rate variability just creates this perfect kind of wave like that. Um, I said 90% because the 10% of the world's population who are over six foot tall might want a slightly lower breath rate, four breaths a minute, 3.5 breaths a minute. It's something to do with the, the distance between your heart and your extremities, apparently. But for most people, five breaths a minute is like a universal sweet spot um, to, to regulate the autonomic nervous system. So yeah, they prescribe for people with PTSD, two 20 minute sessions a day. People with, uh, you know, more, more everyday levels of stress than 20 minutes a day. Don't have to do it before bed because it's due with charging parasympathetic drive. So parasympathetic drive is almost like a kind of rechargeable battery of relaxation. And that helps you get to sleep and stay asleep. Mm. So, you know, like when you're on holiday, many people find they sleep better at night because they spent the day doing more relaxing things than usual. Every time you do something relaxing, you charge up the parasympathetic drive battery. So if you can spend like 20, 30, 40 minutes a day doing something really relaxing, like yoga nidra, like non-sleep deep rest, like coherent breathing, you kind of charged up that battery. So when you go to sleep at night, you kind of, you press it on and sleep will happen much more naturally. Um, and that's what we need to work with these, these internal biological uh, mechanisms that lead to sleep. Because sleep is a natural phenomena. We don't need, every time we do a sleep hygiene hack, even call them hacks. I mean, God, every time we do a sleep hygiene hack, we are telling ourselves that sleep is not natural and I need to make changes to my outer world for sleep to happen. We need to completely reframe that. Sleep is a natural phenomenon that will occur in the absence of the internal biological stresses that prevent it from occurring. All the focus needs to be on the internal biological stresses. Why isn't it? I don't know. I don't know why it isn't. And I want to be part of the movement that puts that right because it just doesn't work. Sleep hygiene work, we're all be sleeping like babies. It's been around for like 10, 15 years now. It doesn't work. There's an epidemic of sleeplessness. We need a stronger medicine. And I think that mindfulness of dream and sleep, which is what the book's based on, is that stronger medicine. That's beautiful. And such a, it's such a good point when you think about other species or babies. Like yeah. that's just, there's an intuitive, natural, very strong argument there. <laughs> yeah, it's the most natural thing ever, right? So it's obviously something internal that's preventing that natural phenomena from occurring. Mm. And it is, it's our, our stress rates reflected yeah. in our breath rates. We talked about the five breaths a minute thing, right? So we, we breathe about 15 to 20 breaths a minute. Our grandparents breathe completely differently. The yeah. average American breath rate in 1929 was 4.9 breaths a minute. That's freaking slow. Or it's not, sorry, it's not, it's actually really normal, but it seems freaking <laughs> slow, right? Yeah. It's completely normal. Um, 1939, it's slightly more, it's like 5.3. Even in the 80s, when I was born, like 1980, it was um, 7.5 breaths a minute. So what's happened in the last 40 years to more than double our breath rate? Well, maybe the same thing that's led to a doubling in rates of anxiety, depression, obesity, diabetes. Could there be a connection? Almost certainly. Is it all to do with breath? Probably not. But does breath play a large role in it? Almost certainly. Yeah. And I, you know, I can think back to so many clients over the years who they struggle to sit down for half an hour on a Wednesday afternoon. There's guilt around mm. relaxing. Ultimately. Yeah. So again, it, as you say, just the, the chronic stress and pressure we have put on ourselves mm. um, is a huge factor here. Mm. Brilliant. Is there anything we haven't mentioned, Charlie, that you just want to maybe emphasize or conclude with? Um. Just that the workshops I do are always free to veterans. So if there are any military veterans watching, then you can always come for free. Um, and that hopefully this stuff is about kind of empowering us to, to take back the reins of our sleep. You know, this isn't about medicalization. This isn't about uh, pathologizing the way we sleep. It's about kind of empowering ourselves to go, I'm there for a third of our lives. A third of my life is spent in this state. 
it just makes sense to try and optimize that not just to be like oh, i'll sleep when i'm dead it's like no you'll die if you don't sleep it's the other way around it's like if you want to live longer and there's actually the direct correlation between um shortness of sleep and shortness of life it re really is that direct um and everything is better i mean we talked about microbiome and and um inflammation affecting sleep it's also the other way around sleep is the greatest anti-inflammatory we have at our disposal the the most powerful non-medical anti-inflammatory we have is sleep it's like that's what it's doing it's it's so if we're only getting five hours of this kind of anti natural anti-inflammatory treatment it would be even better if we're getting six even better if we're getting seven you better if we're getting eight uh, and that will affect our gut health it'll affect our ability to to um um, regulate our emotions and regulate our nervous system. Um, it's there, but we do need to kind of to be, be active in our participation with sleep, I think. Yeah, I love that. Active in our participation of sleep, a good way to conclude. Charlie, thank you so much. It's been a real uh, privilege to, to chat with you and, and learn more about the, the power and the healing power of sleep. Oh, thank you, Alex. It's been a pleasure to chat with you.